Hi, and welcome to our introductory seminar for RISE, Bearings EB-5 Immigration Investment Fund backed by San Francisco East Bay Residential Apartments and Student Housing. The fund is diversified across over 12 assets. It's anchored by three student housing projects located directly next to UC Berkeley, the number one public university in the United States. In this presentation, here is what you're going to learn, how it works, the protections and guarantees, cost and fees, and most importantly, how is RISE so much different and so much better than other EB-5 options? The presentation is designed to be a brief introduction on key topics, but then if you want more, you can actually get deep dive videos on almost every single subject throughout the presentation. This is only an introductory presentation, so be sure to make an appointment with our industry leading EB-5 experts, including award-winning developers, immigration attorneys, and even a former USCIS adjudicator. Using the links in the presentation, you can book those appointments, download the slide decks or the presentations, get EB-5 checklists, and ultimately get the answers to your EB-5 questions. Now, Enjoy the seminar. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our launch event for RISE, which is our, our newest EB-5 offering. It stands for the Residential Income and Strategic EB-5 Fund. Uh, this is our latest EB-5 offering, which expands on everything we've been doing for the last 10 years, focused on residential multifamily apartments, guaranteed job creation through construction. But now we are expanding even deeper on our investment offerings and getting even more protections and terms and, and all kinds of features and benefits, including a brand new whole big time level of diversification, as well as a focus on speed to cash flow, which no other EB-5 projects out there have ever focused on. But the RIA policy has given us that chance, and now we're taking that opportunity. So today is a very quick walkthrough and we're gonna take everybody through the deck and uh, we are going to be blowing through this very, very quickly and then getting to the Q and A sessions. So we have a lot of people that are signed up and a lot of people here. And the, the most important thing is that this is an interactive event. This is meant to be a question and answer period. We wanna hear from everybody that's joining. If you have questions, use the live chat feature and our whole team is here uh, on the front with Peter and I, as well as uh, our team with Kyle, Ashi and Aaron and everybody uh, also in attendance to answer questions through the chat. So uh, be sure to use that as much as you can. Uh, we're also gonna offer downloads and handouts for different presentations and materials that we've had uh, over time. And then we're also gonna release interactive polls. We wanna understand what you guys want, what you don't want, what you understand, what you don't understand, and everything in between. Uh, and then in the end, uh, we're gonna discuss how to potentially take advantage of this introductory period for this brand new fund and just get free stuff. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started uh, and just introducing quickly a little bit about Bering. If you don't know who we are, I'm Colin Bering, CEO and the founder of the Bering Regional Center. Uh, and I'm the CEO of Bearing Capital. I'm joined by Peter Bibbler, our managing director, and the rest of our team all on the backside of this. Uh, $7 billion in experience across all of our executives in real estate, whether it happens to be development, finance, investment, everything in between. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years on the EB-5 side, but then three generations as a family-based company and 100% approval history across the board, 30 countries worth of investors, over 275, 300 investors as of today. It depends on when you talk to us, we are, we're signing new people almost every day. Our company is most known for all of our innovation and the product and features that we have built into these offerings over time. A deeper dive background video is available and posted on YouTube and it's in the links in these decks that you probably received uh, before the event. So uh, for deeper dives and a lot of information, we have videos placed throughout the deck and throughout the presentations, which you're able to go look at when you have more time. But we're gonna blow through this pretty quick today to make sure that you get all the information very fast. A greater focus on the Bering team. I truly believe we have the best regional center team in the country and really, in fact, in the entire industry for this whole EB-5 world. And that's just because we've proven it through product, through our investors' testimonials for how people have felt about our product and where it has taken them as far as 100% approval history. 
we have never had a denial. So 100% approvals on 924s, 526s, 829s, everything in between. We have a tremendous history with whether it's legislation and helping out with policy and helping draft potential policy for Congress, as well as litigation. And a lot of people know us because of our lawsuits at USCIS trying to bring back the EB-5 program when it was effectively canceled by government in 2019. And then again in 2021 and 22, uh, those are stories for another time. Most of you know about that already, or that's the reason you found us. Uh, and another item that we have seen in the RIA that we want to talk about specifically is that being known for our successes is great, but being known for the lack of failures is even better. We do not rent out our name to other people. We do not have failed affiliates. We don't have failed projects. We don't have abandoned investors and people that were sold direct projects and then left on their own to go fight for it. We don't have those failures that are out in the world. Also, you know, we work with a very, very tight knit and well vetted broker and intermediary industry. We do not have a bunch of rogue agents out there that in this new RIA policy will come back to bite people and potentially get the fund canceled or all of the investors denied due to 956 violations, integrity violations, SEC actions, and other things out there where some of these regional centers with deep, dark histories do. We like being known for our successes, but we also like known for not having failures. On the right, you see a couple of pictures of our executives with me, Peter, Aaron, and Greg. Most of you have already talked to us and know who we are. For the RISE Fund, we are rising with RIOZ. And RIOZ is a Bay Area developer here in the San Francisco Bay Area, mostly focused on multifamily housing, including student housing, workforce housing, and market rate multifamily. RIOZ, these guys are professionals at their product type. They built over 70 different buildings, $700 million across the Bay Area, and they had a marketable product that was a perfect fit for the RIA. So we came into this partnership, and this is a loan style investment closer to the traditional EB-5 community in our early years of EB-5, but RIA's an esteemed history, very strong corporate track record and development. And we'll talk more about them and their background and also the products that they have lined up for the RISE Fund. It all begins with our preferred asset class. We're still looking at multifamily apartments. It's student housing, multifamily workforce housing, all in a diversified fund with over 12 projects put together. Diversified is not something you hear in the EB-5 industry. Naturally, it's a single asset invested with a single loan. All the eggs are in one basket, no benefits to the scale. This is where we're doing something different. It's not the first time we've had multiple assets or diversification, but we never did it on an institutional scale like we are right now. Diversification in the rest of the investment world is a major risk mitigant and something to protect your wealth. And now it's finally available on a large scale in EB-5. We like multifamily versus other asset classes compared to things like commercial office, industrial warehouses, retail, grocery stores, whatever it happens to be. You always have to have a place to live. One of the stories my grandfather used to tell me was that in bad times, you're not going to go stay at five-star hotels. You're not going to go out and spend at fancy restaurants, but no matter what, you need a place to live. Residential is good, but residential that's affordable is gold. So that is exactly where we have gone with this latest offering is with smaller, quicker, and easier assets to deliver to market and get to cash flow. And that is also a risk mitigation strategy. And we'll talk more about it later. Again, with the RIAS portfolio, uh, that is part of the RISE fund. We are looking at market rate housing, student housing, workforce housing, and it's all in the East Bay area. And I'm gonna have Peter talk about that next, but this diversified income fund focus on residential, we'll talk about the RIA policy and how we believe it's a perfect fit for people today looking at EB-5. I'm gonna introduce Peter, our managing director, and just let him take the story from here. Well, sure. So obviously key to real estate is location. Being developers and real estate developers and investors ourselves, we know and understand and like East Bay. And that's where we resonate with uh, Riaz Capital. 
the developers for this project. So not only are we diversified across assets, we're diversified across geography as well. We have some great locations in Jack London Square, which is along the waterfront, kind of a eatery and, and entertainment hotspot for Oakland. We're in downtown Oakland, where we have key employers like Kaiser Permanente, Blue Shield of California, PG&E just purchased a $900 million headquarters building just near one of our other projects that support the employment community in these areas. We have projects in Emeryville. Emeryville, some of you may know as the headquarters for Pixar Animation Studios. We are excited to have some student housing opportunities in this fund that are located in Berkeley. One of the key things to EB-5, of course, is how do these projects create jobs in order for you and your families to qualify for the green card? And if you're picking a good project and with a solid developer, a good, a strong platform, this is actually one of the simplest aspects to the EP5 process. If you have a, a, a projects that are already underway of construction, jobs that are already being created, which we do have here, and we'll show you that in a moment, these jobs will be uh, created. So you can see here, Across these assets, we're going to create more than 3,200 jobs for all investors. And that's more than double the amount needed for 131 maximum investors to this project. This job creation is backed by a construction completion guarantee. And these are construction related jobs. This is something like the most straightforward approach to proving job creation to USCIS for your green card, where your EB-5 funds go to construction costs. We have a video on this and, and deeper dives to kind of, and I know there's a lot of questions often about job creation. So we'll check out that video and you'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Here you can see we have four assets that are already underway. And that's what's great about this project is that usually with EB-5, you're often stuck with one project and you're stuck with all that risk at the beginning and you're waiting over three, four years for completion before that risk is mitigated and, and, and goes away. Here, as we're diversified across these assets, job creation and construction is already underway. That's creating jobs for EB-5 investors, but it's also de-risking the project as projects get completed faster over time. This brings cash flow to the fund. It brings, it increases the value of the security for the EB-5 loan of your investments. Taking a step back and just kind of talking about how this works. Essentially, this is a, a portfolio loan. Bearing and your new commercial enterprise in which you're investing is making a five-year loan to Riaz Capital, our partner developer in this project. The EB-5 funds are going to be diversified across 12 different assets. These are smaller assets. These are simple projects. Like we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but uh, these are three to five, six story buildings. These are faster construction, simpler in terms of actual construction build. It's diversified across these assets and it's backed by basic guarantees to protect the EB-5 investment. We've done this before. This portfolio approach is nothing new to EB-5, to USCIS. Bering, in fact, has taken this portfolio approach in previous projects. In that project, the projects were completed, the projects were leased up. And for those investors, actually, to date, it's been 100% I-526 approvals for those. We've had 100% repayment on those investors and 829 approvals for that project as well, as recently as last week. So this is, uh, like I said, a portfolio approach offers diversification for investors. You don't see that very often in the EB-5 space, uh, but there is precedent for it. And we've had a successful approach with this before. The guarantees, when you do a project like this, you're choosing the platform and the people behind the project. And we're gonna be with you at each step of your EB-5 journeys. At the beginning, we're backing your I-526 petition, guaranteeing approval or your money back. During the course of construction, we're guaranteeing that job creation through the construction completion guarantees, guaranteeing that these projects are indeed finished to create that job creation, those jobs for your green card. And then at the end, we're there at the end and backing your investment with 100% developer equity pledge 
for repayment of your loan. What's great about this particular project, the RISE Fund, and why we're excited to offer this, is this diversification. You can see that the EB-5 funds are spread across 12 different cash flowing assets. These are all apartment buildings for rent, entry level, easy to rent, smaller units, fast to build, fast to rent. The average risk in terms of the EB-5 loan going into any particular asset faces is backed by a guarantee across four guarantors to this project. And it's, it's over 9x, the EB-5 amount. We have other risk mitigations in place to reduce risk and protect the EP5 investment, such as a minimum 25% uh, developer equity in these projects. And, and you'll find that across these assets, and you can kind of see this in this graph graphic that we have below, is that EP5 makes a small portion of any individual asset over time in these capital stacks. Generally across the board between 7% to 25% at most. And so we're not overly relying on EB-5 for the success of these projects, and it's backed by developer equity. And as Colin was saying, this project really is optimized for the new era. You know, sometimes we refer to this as EB-5 3.0, Post-Reform and Integrity Act, which was passed last year. These are, and, and especially appropriate in the climate that we're in now. You know, there's a, a uncertainty in the climate in terms of high interest rates, recessionary uh, claims, you know, still coming out of the COVID pandemic and, and new strains coming out of what is the future of that. So this residential rental approach diversified across 12 assets and, and phase construction provides a more risk averse or defensive strategy to EB-5 investment. From a regional center point of view and even an EB-5 investor point of view, this is a simpler project. You know, instead of a, a giant hotel project where you're waiting years for that for completion and then relying on occupancy rates, you know, uh, it, to fill up those rooms and maintain a, a constant uh, room occupancy. These are smaller constructions, like I said, uh, low rise to mid rise, typically um, three floors to seven floors. They're simpler, they're faster to build. It's easy to kind of monitor and, and verify progress of these types of construction. And it's not nearly as complex of a construction project. And there's a deep pool of contractors that we can go to, not just us, but the developer to go to, to develop these buildings. And importantly, we have a strong guarantee backed by four separate guarantors behind the, the loan, EB-5 loan. Jobs are already under construction and it's already, some of these assets will be completed as soon as next year so that de-risks the project by increasing the security, the value of the security, the de developer equity pledge, backing the repayment of your EB-5 loan. All these factors kind of made us very excited when we identified Rios Capital as a potential partner for this project. This We like residential. Uh, we've been successful in portfolio approach in the past. And um, you know this gives us opportunities to offer EB-5 investors a diversified portfolio that includes not only entry-level multifamily apartments, but also student housing in Berkeley. Um, and, and I think at this time, it's just a, a great opportunity for them. So in terms of the, what is the investment, right? Colin said this is, you know, the structure is something you've seen before, and, that, and that's true. This is something that USCIS has seen before and we've done before and has been easily approved in the past. So this is a, a loan style investment that you're making. So in, whenever you do EB-5, whether it's with us or other, other companies, you're making an investment in a limited partnership, what we call a new commercial enterprise. And the sole purpose of that limited partnership is to make a loan to the project. And that's what you're doing here. So it's a five-year loan at $800,000, which is the minimum investment amount because it qualifies for a TEA, the visa set aside for high unemployment area projects. It's for five years, and it has a modicum of interest. This is not a, a traditional investment vehicle. We will be offering those in the future, so stay tuned for that announcement yep. where you could participate in what we call our legacy fund, which will offer an opportunity for higher returns in different investment structures. This one is a simpler approach, a very common approach. You have priority in the return of your capital over the developer over the other potential EB-5 investment options 
in the uh, near, very near future. I mean, there's going to be a lot of different facts and data and things like that, but the real difference of what the Rise Fund is, is that it really does hammer home the idea of like real risk mitigation. Right now, we're at the very tail end of another offering that we've had out for a while at 1900 Broadway. And individual investors that have signed up recently within the last month, two months, three months, whatever it happens to be, they're looking at a nearly complete 39-story tower. That feels good. The project's almost done. The jobs are created. You're getting in when a lot of risk and milestones have already either been mitigated or completed. So people look at it and they feel like it's a lot lower risk. What is a step past that? Not only do you have the construction progress that we were talking about back here, where you already have hundreds of jobs that have been created, and you already have buildings that are taking shape, they're taking form, and they're, one of them is very close to being open to the public and starting to cash flow. Uh, probably anybody here that happens to be on this call that is present and or is going to see the replay, we will likely have cash flow from these assets before you actually finish your source of funds, file your I-526, and get a receipt notice from USCIS. So these assets are performing faster than we are. We have visual capability into the project to see performance before we ever have to sign up. That certainty and that progress is something worth paying for. That is reducing risk. And having a portfolio of assets goes even further where it's not just one project that if it's done right, you'll do well. If you put all your eggs in one basket, one project has a problem, all your money has a problem, you're looking at a portfolio of 12 assets diversifying your risk while almost guaranteeing your job creation ahead of time because of the progress and having nexus to all jobs out of all assets in the entire portfolio because of regional center indirect job creation and the calculation that we get as an accredited regional center by USCIS. Uh, for Nexus purposes and for USCIS and actually drawing a line from your cash to a job creating entity and getting specific credit being connected to it all, that's something that we handle on our side. We manage asset by asset, loan by loan on an individual basis, monitoring the construction progress of each deal, making sure that everything is running according to the loan agreement and all of the guarantees, the covenants, the restrictions, everything that a borrower and lender are supposed to agree on ahead of time. That's our job, that's what we do. And we've been a developer, we've been an investors, we've been borrowers, we've been lenders. We are vertically integrated and we've played up and down the food chain on every single role, making us extremely qualified to look after this loan. If there was an issue, which we don't expect and Riaz has never needed a rescue previously, we would be able to step in and complete a project and deliver it to market and recover the capital. That's kind of the difference between having an integrated firm with capable people and a history of track record and resources versus just going to an underpaid babysitter of an agent, which some regional centers out there, uh, really that's all they are. They don't have development expertise. They have no construction people and they've never built anything. So if a loan got in trouble and they needed to step in, take possession of the asset, fix a troubled deal, negotiating with busted contractors that are behind on payments, very angry, is that regional center going to be able to step in? Probably not. That's a different story when you have a group that has resources and history like ours. And the first step to mitigating all that risk is pick a phenomenal partner. And that's what we have with Riaz Capital. So stressing the diversification and the spreading around of the investment across 12 different projects, I'll go to an exhibit that we have at the end of the program where we're talking about the difference of what that actually looks like and what does diversification actually do for you. And here you have the 12 assets. You've got their capital stack, equity, debt, and EB-5, 12 smaller deals. But in the end, when you have a, the guarantor, the borrower, and the security behind this, this is a lot of equity altogether diversified through 12 projects. If one of them has a problem, Stepping in and curing that problem child is a lot more tangible and a lot more feasible when they're smaller deals. When you see some of the EB-5 firms out there that get in trouble and you start seeing it hit the headlines and it makes major news, 
it's typically on deals that are so big that nobody has any chance of coming in to save it. And those are in the billions. You know, you've got one and a half billion, you've got a $2 billion project. You have refineries or very, very specialized assets in natural resources or energy or something where there are no buyers for that problem project when it runs out of money. Smaller, faster, common product types like multifamily apartments where each asset ranges anywhere from $10 million all the way up to maybe 100 at the top of our, our size ranges for this portfolio, that can be fixed by a lot of people and a lot of developers and even a lot of banks that'll step in and buy stuff. You have a deep buyer pool. There's a lot of people that are willing to participate in that world, that market. Meaning if you have a deeper buyer pool, you have more people that are willing to pay cash for the asset that you want to unload and recover your money. All of this calculates into the risk profile of why you take on a project or you pass. But being able to see that risk truly spread out and to see it on 12 lower risk assets in general with lower dollar amounts in the RIA world where it's very feasible that people will be in and out of the EB-5 program much faster. So if people have an ability to get their green cards faster, they're probably not gonna wanna stay in the investment that much longer than it took to get the green card. These are the perfect assets and the perfect portfolio to be able to try and mitigate your risk of time, your risk of schedule. Before, if you had six year backlogs, seven year backlogs, plus your I-526 adjudication times and all this stuff added up, you weren't in the biggest rush, but with the RIA policy, with concurrent filing, with the reserve set asides, priority processing in some areas, and the potential for expedites on certain assets, people are having a vision that they're going to get through EB-5 much faster. But did you pick a project that is actually going to complete and be able to repay you within that said time frame? That's a risk that is typically underwritten, and it's harder to see. There are projects out there that say it's, it's a five-year loan. It's only going to be five years. You can have your money back. But in reality, they have no chance that they're actually going to complete and repay you in five years. Sometimes you look at these large scale master plan subdivisions in home building, 8% loans, 9% home building loans. They're not actually in a hurry to build all those houses in this kind of environment when no one's buying and you've got really expensive construction costs that are not coming down, 39% home builders inflation since 2021 and 2020 since COVID. They're sitting on their hands. They are not building lots. They're not actually laying out sewer water streets. There are no homes under construction compared to the vast size and scale of the master plan. The difference with the master plan community where if they have 800 homes and they're only building 10 or 15 at a time, it's gonna take 15 years. With these multifamily apartment projects, it's really in most cases one building and then maybe two but the whole project is built at the same time. It's built with the same GMP contract, the same guaranteed cost, and the same schedule in which the general contractor is locked into. They're going to deliver that building for a guaranteed price. And it's a building that has a tangible design. It's something that is easier to build. It's commonplace. Some materials are not rare. A lot of this stuff can be produced domestically. You have very little delivery risk coming to this kind of stuff. When you're looking at a 10 year master plan community, you have no guarantees on the cost of the building of each home because no contractor is ever actually going to commit to a fixed guaranteed price, knowing they have 10 years of inflation exposure. If a developer says, I quit, we're gonna sit on our hands and wait for the market to get better and then start building homes again, all those contractors get another bite at the apple. They're gonna reset all their pricing. They might not like that developer as much as they used to, bid prices go up, all of a sudden, you do not have the pro forma that you did before. You do not have the profit margins that you thought you had before from years ago. Anybody that bid a price that was in 2020 and if they have the chance to renege on it today, 39% construction inflation, they're saying, forget it. With these buildings, guaranteed GMP contracts, guaranteed maximum price, locked in, bought out, already being delivered under construction, very strong transparency. We love this product for the RIA at this moment in time with no retrogression, concurrent filing capabilities, which we haven't really talked about, but a lot of you have seen the material. 
And that's probably when, uh, after we start putting all this stuff in front of you, I do recommend checking out the videos on the YouTube channel. Do check that out because concurrent filing, the use of unsecured loans and all these other specialty items that are out there in these tools in the toolbox, you get great videos from Peter and explainers and definitions, glossary items. We've got other immigration attorneys on there explaining things. Do check that out because uh, there's a, just a, over 200 plus videos on there trying to explain EB-5 in the simplest way possible. And uh, we're continuing to post things every week. We can open it up for Q&A if people have questions. And this was fast. It was a lot of content, but we're happy to start over at any point and talk about it. If you guys have questions, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and take those now. Here's a general question that just came up uh, indirectly. So talk about job creation and jobs that were created before you signed up versus today and, and right now, really. Talking about job creation and how you can get credit for it, even though uh, the jobs may have taken place before you actually subscribed. If you start construction on a project, USCIS knows that the timing of EB-5 and, and sourcing an EB-5 investor, subscribing, even getting an I-526 approval, potentially having some kind of release conditions attached to that investment, they know that the timing is up and down. So what they did, I think it was the 2013 uh, EB-5 policy memorandum where they talked about bridge financing. And they talked about the ability to fund projects ahead of time with temporary bridge financing with the anticipation that EB-5 is coming. What that allows you to do is it allows you to continue on your course, build your project, get through it without the risk of not finding an EB-5 investor. If you find the EB-5 investor and you have temporary bridge financing in place, the investor can replace that bridge financing and get credit for those jobs, even though the jobs may have already been created. So that's the benefit. If it's temporary bridge financing and we have special language in our documents that account for that before we actually get started, that's how we're able to hold the place for EB-5 investors and bank permanent jobs while investors are subscribing. Even if you take your time filing and even if you're delayed for freeing up capital or getting AI qualifications or doing anything, you still can get job creation credit because of our bridge financing language and reserves that are pointed out in our offering documents. So I hope that answers that question. And just to add to that, you know, because there's a related question about job creation. There are a couple of things that are going to, you know, the, the question I should, I should say, the question is about whether or not there's insufficient job creation. We, what if we don't create enough jobs for so many investors? There are a couple of things at play. One, we know ahead of time how many jobs we're going to create over the course of the construction of all these projects. And we're actually going to create more than double the amount of jobs necessary if we got all investors subscribed to this project. So even if budgets vary a little bit, we'll still have more than enough. We have, we have that cushion, we have that job buffer that ensures that investors are going to get more than double of jobs that they need. We only need 1,300. If, we, if all investors subscribe, we're going to have an extra nearly 2,000 jobs available. As everybody knows in the real estate business, I mean, construction, construction budgets don't get uh, smaller, they get bigger if projects go, you know, go longer than is necessary. That creates more jobs. It's unlikely, uh, the worst case scenario you have is if there's a, um, a project failure. But even if there's a project failure, if there's enough jobs created in that, uh, up to that point, those investors can still get the green card. And that's why usually whenever we underwrite a deal, we make sure that there's sufficient job creation across the entire, you know, by each asset and across the entire project to ensure that there's a sufficient cushion there. For the first investor that signs up, there's a 3,000 job yeah. cushion for that person. It doesn't actually matter to you. As people sign up later, you're always going to have that minimum cushion, even if you're the last investor. And that's how we structure these. It's not necessarily the 20% buffer matters for everyone. It only matters for the last investor that happens to be filing an IA29, who actually has the most time and the most opportunity to create their jobs anyway. The first investor in who files and is probably the first investor out, they are the ones that need their first 10 jobs as fast as possible. And inherently, they're in front of the line compared to everybody else anyway. Seeing questions about getting the slides, uh, yes, we, we are going to post the, the handout and have that downloadable here shortly. Uh, it looks like Kyle found that job creation risk analysis. So 
uh, that is going to be available for download too. This is a common misconception in the industry. So it's always a, a good PDF to take a look at because job buffers mean a lot of different things, but you know, this is really explaining it very clearly for people. So that's coming up too. How do we do TEAs for something like this? So TEA, the, you know, the rules changed a little bit after the new law was passed last year. You know, historically you would go to a, the state government body to issue a TEA letter and you would submit that to USCIS and they would defer to that letter's conclusion, the, the state government's conclusion that this qualified as a TEA. That changed last year. Now you have to submit evidence of a, that the, the project qualifies for a TEA at the time of filing. Now the, the letters really haven't changed in content per se. It's just that, at least for us, we go to a third party economist like Baker Tilly to run the numbers, analyze the project, basically where the project, which census tract the project's located in, what is the unemployment rate in that census tract or adjacent census tracts, the weighted average of that unemployment rate, and determine whether or not it is qualified as a TEA, targeted employment area project or high unemployment area project. You'll hear both these terms interchangeably in, uh, in these post RIA regime. The sources that the economists like Baker Tilly relies on are sources that are identified by USCIS as uh, legitimate sources or acceptable sources. So it is pretty formulaic. There's not a lot of mystery or manipulation, especially post RIA, it makes it much more methodical. And there's even online calculators that you could access yourself and look up an address and see if it qualifies for a TEA or not. So for this project, we look at each individual asset and obtain evidence of a TEA and a TEA letter from our economist for each individual asset that's submitted with USCIS. And these letters are valid for two years under uh, the new law. It used to be only one year. And TEA matters at the time of filing your application, right? The whole point of EB-5 program is to provide economic stimulus and to create jobs in communities that need it, whether it's rural communities, high unemployment area communities, it's to create jobs. So the whole purpose is to make it over time less high unemployment in these areas. So it's okay that the projects are no longer TEA, no longer high unemployment area projects at the time that your application is being reviewed and approved. It's key that it's they look at the time of filing for you. And that's what we'll submit with our letters uh, as evidence that these projects and each asset covers uh, the TEA. Taking a look at a, a question, I, I'm going to try not to use people's names because I don't know if I have permission at all, but you know, individuals asking about like, you know, what are the, the cash flow numbers on 12 different projects? We do have all the financials, we have the models, we have roll up models that show the portfolio as a whole. Please make appointments with our Calendly link and sign up to talk to our team because after getting qualified and having accredited investor status and all that stuff looked at, uh, we can actually give you access to the full data room, which will have all the background information on the assets. There is NDAs in place because there is sensitivity for different banks and participants that are in the deals. All of the financial information is going to be in our investor portal, just similar to anybody that has worked with us on any of our other projects. There's a war room and a data room with all the presentations and all that items. That stuff, you just need to get qualified first. And then at that point, that is when you'll be able to see all the information. From a general perspective, the kind of metrics that we're looking for are certain NOIs, cash on cash returns, leverage limits, as well as debt service coverage ratios. As a lender, we want to make sure that the asset, the target asset is able to cover its debt service, to be cash flow positive and to be able to rent into the future where if it did hurt and it head into economic headwinds, it would simply be able to ride that out with existing cash flow that can get on the market today and then ride higher into the future as the rental environment normalizes and the economy recovers and starts to proceed forward again. DSCR targets, you know, whether it happens to be a 1.2 to a 1.35, you know, depending on economic scenarios they change each asset has a different debt service coverage ratio, has different sizing. It also has a different uh, either a senior loan or no senior loan. We have to actually underwrite each asset individually. And that is uh, just as the duty of a lender, every single project has, has to stand on its own, 
qualify and earn its own way. When we ask a simple question, like what's the cash flow numbers for 12 deals, it turns into a lot of documents. And we're happy to do that for those that are really interested in the RISE project and want to invest in something that looks like this. And to do that due diligence, make an appointment, and we'll definitely get you access after qualification. There are targets and financial metrics that just stand as a standard for each deal as it goes today. The next one that I saw that is actually worth discussing, when somebody talks about X percentage of job creation has been complete, it's really almost just like saying the construction budget has been spent by X dollars because 100% of our job creation can be met just through the construction alone. If they complete 60% of the construction, it's likely they've achieved 60% or more of the expected job creation. When you see metrics like that, it's really typically just a metric of progress and actual expenditure. So not hammers being swung on a site with individual people, but the expenditure and the draws, the construction draws that a bank would see. Somebody asked me, uh, why, why are the returns so low compared to something they saw at 1900 Broadway? The answer to that is it's actually a different investment product. We have multiple different investment projects and products. Uh, Peter had mentioned it earlier where like there is an introduction uh, to our different assets and the other things that we do. But if you go to our, our homepage, you actually can see our three profiles. The max protection, the debt style investments is this one on the left. It's 100% focused on protections, guarantees, and risk mitigation. It tries to get the risk as low as we can while qualifying for EB-5 at risk provisions. Then in the middle is preferred equity and then there's common equity. They're different profiles with different risks. Today, we only talked about the max protection. So that's why if the quoted returns look different, it's because somebody was looking at the probably the common equity for 1900 Broadway when it was open. So that's kind of the explanation on that. Is that clear, hopefully, for everybody? Perfect. Um, we'll have a separate webinar yeah. for that here in the near future for that too. Somebody asking about, well, like, doesn't there have to be risk? And the answer is yes. The, one of the, the basic requirements of EB-5 investment is that the investment must be at risk. There must be risk of loss and chance of gain. So when you have a low interest return or technically a preferred return as an equity investor, uh, you, know, you have the chance for gain because of the financial prospect, but the chance for loss, no matter what happens, you can have a repayment guarantee, a completion guarantee, I-526 denial guarantees, these do not 100% mitigate the chance of loss of capital. The guarantee is only as good as a guarantor. If the guarantor goes bust, the guarantee is not worth anything. The guarantor files for bankruptcy. That means the guarantor is not going to save you in the chance of an economic decline. There were challenges to those kind of things way back in the early days of EB-5 when they saw the word guarantee and people would freak out, USCIS would freak out. And that has all since changed because uh, guarantees are not a 100% mitigation of risk. Things that are a 100% mitigation of risk and completely not okay for EB-5 are things like people putting up sham projects where you invest $800,000, somebody moves it into a project or then moves it into a bank account that sits there doing nothing out on the side, not at risk, not job creating, just sitting and waiting, trying to get a green card, that gets people denied. That is not at risk. That is not true to the heart of the program. Doing little things like that is not okay. Those are the kind of things that get you denied. That is not at risk. So that, that's how that question works. Uh, the, yep, so Sumit, I think we got that one. Uh, the next questions, what do you see, Peter? How does cash flow help? How does you know this faster? The what we what we often say is you know quicker to completion, quicker to cash flow. How does that help uh, the EB five investor? Is it for payment of the preferred returns, or is it for securing the capital invested? Oh, quicker to cash flow and how that works. Which yeah. It's, this is probably something that should have been part of a uh, more a larger part of the main presentation. Cash flow means performance. And if you have performance, 
you can bear down on what exactly you're getting into as far as risk very quickly. The key to a lot of EB-5 projects that raise capital, get people's money when they never really deserved it ever is because the prospect of having performance and being able to actually see what kind of quality that project is or how much risk it really had behind the curtain, you have to see performance. And with some of these projects, you know, there's a long tail schedule, you know, three years, four years in order to get to wherever it's supposed to go and start cash flowing. That's normal. That's how large projects work. That's how high rises work. That's how large scale master plan communities work. You have to do a lot of sewer water streets and a lot of stuff to build out everything. And then finally get to the joke is, you know, it takes $15 million to flush the first toilet when you're building a massive golf course community because you have to build everything out in a ton of sewer water streets just to get to one house. That is risky. Not a lot of people know it. They think they have one little house and then that's like the little bit of risk, but it's actually exactly the opposite. With this style of product in these apartments, and when you see the kind of progress that they already have, and if there's already cash flow and rents locked in, it's audit time. Like you are able to take a look at performance and see what's going on and know what your risk is before you ever spent a dime. That is really rare. And that is a very, very strong position to be in as a, an investor to actually see what's going on under the hood. Instead of somebody saying, hey, come back in three years and then we'll know. That is one of the major reasons that we went running toward this asset class with this kind of product type in this market, in this policy, we believe this is the future of EB-5. And, and for those offerings that are not doing this, they are not going to be competitive because they are not going to be able to tell investors the same information and the same content and give them the same certainty of performance compared to what this asset type can do. We have done it before, you know, BRC Partners 4 that we started in 2016 with Madison Park Financial Group, very successful. Three projects built, 100% approved, i 526 we even had IA29s approved, like Peter had mentioned. Very successful. Seven yeah, seven-month adjudication. Congratulations to that unnamed investor that I don't have permission to say his name. But why don't you see this stuff? Why is it not on the market? It's because it's hard to take multiple projects, underwrite all of them, adjudicate it, put it into documentation, administer it. But also many developers are doing one-off deals. They have one single LP, there's a general partnership. It's got its own carried interest, preferred returns, and it's separate, it's siloed. It has its own performance. They're not going to take a portfolio approach to 12 assets all at the same time. This is where RIAS Capital and Bering are very, very much aligned. They are talking about a portfolio approach, long-term cash flow, total returns, cash flow plus asset appreciation. And then they also have opportunity zone money where you're looking at long-term capital gains mitigation, 10-year commitments on their equity. They are going to be in there for a while. And that also buys you a long-term horizon, which you can bottle up multiple assets in that same construction horizon and go get it built. So uh, again, having visibility where you look at the fourth asset at Magnolia over there, that thing is very, very close to being on the market. It's going to be leasing, it's gonna have cash flow. it's gonna have proof. That is different than signing up for a brand new deal that might be open 2026, maybe if it's starting today. That is materially different and quick to cash flow with low risk construction product, there's nowhere else you'd wanna be. And then that becomes the conversation about rural versus urban when you talk about where you wanna be. So that's a totally different deal. And if anybody wants us to discuss that on this call, we can go in that direction, but I'm gonna wait until somebody asks because it's a long story. Peter, you talked about the TEA letters. Effectively, every single asset that's listed has a TEA letter and confirmation from an economist. Each asset is verified, they all stand alone. Every single project, whether we did that together or by itself, they would all qualify. So just to give a, a simple answer on TEA letters. The other questions that happen to be listed, the Legacy Fund is a, a what we call a syndicate lender, and it participates in the loan 
it takes a different position from the underlying lenders and the BRC Partner 7 Fund. And we're going to talk about that stuff in a separate presentation. There's risk for equity investors. That's because that's what equity does. And then the preferred equity obviously is a little bit different, but for debt style max protection, that is where we're putting that stuff way up front. And you have like the full list of protections and guarantees, priority positions and repayment. This is built to have the lowest risk in our, our entire our portfolio of options. That's what the max protect is for. The preferred returns, the preferred equity, the common equity, it's a different investment and it's long-term where it's not exactly a fixed five-year loan with a fixed agreement, repayment, uh, demands, and a default attached to it. Equity is equity. There's targets and there are horizons for certain triggers, but it's not a default, a loan agreement. There's a borrower and a lender and it's very clear. A little bit different in how they structure, but some things overlap. You know, the legacy fund is a different beast. It's also multi-asset, multi-project. This is multi-project as well, but it's solely focused on this identified portfolio. Legacy fund is across our entire asset portfolio, including 1900 Broadway and everything else. That is kind of an investment in the bearing platform more so than just a single EB-5 venture. Hopefully that adds some color, but that's gonna be a different presentation outside of this one. One individual is talking about inflation and the loss of value due to inflation. And another way of talking about that is, is really the same vein as talking about opportunity cost. It's a personal preference of risk and return. Some investors, have a certain risk appetite. They have a certain return requirement for their money. There are other investors that they really want a secure path to immigration and they get their capital back. They're going to call that a win. They're not looking at this like a financial instrument that is supposed to be financially accretive over time, where there's a base return that exceeds inflation plus an index. There are people that culturally are much more comfortable with a loan style scenario. You can borrow my money in five years, you pay it back. That's it. It might be low returns, but we're very straight on that agreement. It happens to be some of our far East Asian countries, what it happens to be China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam, some of the stuff in Malaysia. There are a lot of countries out there that just prefer a simple loan style investment. And this is kind of what that, um, the impetus for that in the early EB-5 days and where that all came from. Those were the early participants in EB-5 as well, and the majority. Equity was something that really bearing spearheaded on a larger institutional scale. And some of the other groups that you see take advantage of that are really a lot of individuals that already live in the United States. They're already comfortable with real estate. They're even more comfortable with San Francisco Bay Area real estate. Those are individuals that have in a hunger for equity positions and to own real estate and benefit from that real estate, whether it happens to be cash flow from income and rents or capital appreciation from things like inflation caused appreciation. It's really personal preference and risk and return profile and your tolerance for risk. Sometimes there are kids that have borrowed their parents' money or their grandparents' retirement money to make this EB-5 investment. They are not going to take a significant amount of risk on their grandparents' nest egg. Younger, successful software engineer with a lot of stocks and makes a ton of money. They don't have children. They don't have dependents or somebody relying on them for sustenance and food. That person might take more risk. That's because that money has less weight attached to it. Different profiles, different strokes, different folks. That's really a personal risk and return profile. So it's not that one project is better than another. Sometimes it's structure, sometimes it's partnership. There's a lot of things that drive what comes out of these deals. And there's a lot that goes on behind the curtain and a lot to talk about. And uh, for the individuals that joined today, the links that were in the email invites uh, have this deck and a version of it that's uh, more readable. You'll be able to find this material in the email. The questions about fees, extra fees on top of the $800,000 investment, Fees vary. Fees, you know, on a face rate for some projects, the face rate might be as high as $70,000. Things have changed significantly, everyone. If you, depending on what channels you go through to find your project and everything else, fees will be all over the place. The best way to get the most reasonable fees, the most reasonable discounts, 
relationship-based discounts, multi-asset discounts. We have investors that are invested in our private equity funds, and they're also invested in the EB-5 products, whether it happens to be debt, PREF, or common. There's different ways to get discounts. There are certain fees that are unavoidable. Immigration attorneys, source of funds reports, the consultants needed to complete those reports, as well as USCIS related fees, that stuff is going to be unavoidable. Um, you're, you're probably going to be in the range upwards of probably 35,000 total for the USCIS fees plus immigration attorneys and source of funds. It's going to be anywhere in those range. If you have translation involved, it's higher. If you have multiple sources of funds, multiple places that it's coming from, multiple countries, multiple you know, languages, anything that can complicate and add more hours to that effort, it can get very expensive. However, the best way to get the lowest fees possible that are reasonable for the amount of work your case requests, make an appointment, talk to professionals, talk to immigration attorneys, talk to CPAs, talk to regional centers, talk to us, you'll get the best deal that's out there. As far as bearing goes, we don't lose investors because of fees. We lose investors only usually because it's something structural where the investor is really not able to continue for because of a source of funds conflict or something where they're really not qualified or they shouldn't be making the investment because of time constraints or schedule requirements. We don't lose people because of unreasonable fees. If you want the best deal possible, you have to ask directly. And if you're really nice, people like Peter and Kyle will make a deal without telling me. So, yeah, you get the lowest, lowest price possible. Just like Colin said, we encourage you to make an appointment. Uh, you know, a lot of you have questions. We may, you know, if we didn't get to your question or, you know, you think of a question later, which is you know, completely natural just because we've thrown a lot of information in a relatively short period of time, you know, I do encourage you to make an appointment. That's one of the things we like doing most is just answering questions. It's a substantial commitment for folks. It's not an easy decision to make. And so we want to make sure that you have all the information you need from us. Uh, to make it easier to make that decision so that you're you know comfortable and confident going forward when you when you're ready to do so that is rise our residential income and strategic eb5 fund focused on speed to cash flow and diversification for the first time ever on a large scale we believe it's going to be a tremendous success a, a huge benefit to the future of eb5 investment in general so thank you guys for joining and we look forward to talking to you soon thank you